I'm in already. And the YouTube is coming up. I see that it's live. Okay, great. Ta-da. All right. Joe, do you want to entertain with some owl calls for a couple minutes while people come in? Sure. Uh, all of the owl calls you told me just immediately left my head. <laughs> You want me to refresh you? So we have to do uh, South African owl calls because this is a yeah. South African program. So uh, I remember the, the spotted eagle owl. Okay. Now, Jonathan, right. you have to hoot back. Already? Yeah, <laughs> Joe does it right. You have to hoot back. Our smart brain suddenly gone to mush with all owl hooting. <laughs> calling stuff. I'm embarrassed <laughs> about enough about what I'm going to have, to, what I'm about to say. I don't want to make it worse now with my owl renditions. We'll, you know? we'll do it this way. Those are nice owls, those. Where did you get those from? Oh, this guy from South Africa, when he won this World Owl Hall of Fame Award and came to Houston, Minnesota, he brought these along. They were made by kids I'm in South Africa from owlproject.org. I'm really glad they're still around. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's nice. Oh, they're On all permanent. They're beautiful. Yeah, they're beautiful. Bottle tops for eyes. Nice. It always amazes me that those kids who live in such a drab environment can come up with so much color. Yeah, I like this yeah. one the best. So colorful. Yeah, I saw there was one that some kid did that was just completely black. And it had the most beautiful eyes. He had just done the eyes and obviously he'd run out of time or like he'd just done the eyes and that was what he thought was enough. And then he just painted the whole rest of the owl just jet black. It's one of my favorites. You know? well, I think we should have you do a Varro's eagle owl because they're, are, they're larger than great horned owls. They are, aren't they, Jonathan? Um, I don't know. I mean, they... they they're pretty large. I don't know the dimensions of the great horned owl, but I would imagine, you know, I don't know if they're the largest owl in South Africa, in Africa. I think they are, I think but so. the pale fishing owl is also quite a big owl. So, but I think that the Vera eagle owl is the, is the largest owl in South Africa, as far as I know. Do you need a refresher, Joe? Um, so items on that nest, they were bringing in genets. They were eating hedgehogs. They were eating, they can take quite big prey. Wow. Those are. So and they sound. And a couple of owls, too. Ooh. 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 On the neck. Mm. Okay. So I think that one was a. Ooh. 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 Yeah, it's just like one. Ooh. And you hear it across the night. It's Ooh. a very deep, Ooh. deep call. You have a deep voice, Jonathan. You should do that one. <laughs> yeah. This is something that you obviously spring on your guest speakers. You don't tell them in the warm up, like, listen, you're going to be asked to be doing owl calls. So I brush told up on you. your owl calls. You wait for it to go live streaming and then you start. Now, Jonathan, we'd like you to do this owl call. <laughs> is it not fun? <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, yeah. What about Pearl Spotted Owlet? Mm, that's quite an easy call. Go for it. That's it. Hey, you did an owl call. Yay. I can't believe I, can't believe I did an owl call, but yeah, that's my pearl spot with an owlet. So now the rest of your presentation will be a piece of cake, right? That was the difficult bit. Yeah. Unless my questions are all going to be, can you do a this owl call? And can you do a that owl call? <laughs> and even if people don't put those in the Q&A, Joe and I will ask you that, like somebody if else. If anybody <laughs> asks me to do any owl call, any owl call, I'm just going to do the pearl-spotted owl call, irrespective of what owl they ask me to do. I actually, there was a guy that I met who could do the wood owl call very well. And I was guiding a whole lot of a bird club when I was working in forestry, looking at birds of prey in forestry. And he was down at his tent and he was doing this wood owl call. 
And I really thought it was a wood owl. So I got everyone with my torch. And I said, let's go down and, and I'll show you the wood owl. We went down there. It was a guy called Chris Nell. He was very proud of his wood owl call. I was a little, I was a little put out, you know. It felt like I'd, you know, fallen for it. But I definitely had. It was a good wood owl call. Very good. I'm not going to make the wood owl call uh, sound. That, yeah. You're just leaving everybody hanging. I don't think I have a wood owl on my phone. I don't. It's very pretty. I do not. Gosh, what does it sound like, Jonathan? Oh, I shouldn't have told that story. I knew <laughs> as I started that story that I was, I was heading in the wrong direction. Uh, well, it, it, it'll your, for a lot of your viewers, it, they'll, that reason alone, they should come to South Africa to hear the wood owl call. It can remain an enigma until they get here. Yes. And then I'll, I'll, I can take them on a tour. I'll get hold of Chris Nell. And they can hear wood owl calls. They can hear wood owl calls throughout the day and night, which is very unusual. Okay. Well, I did hear wood owl calls when I was in South Africa. It was one of the few that I heard. You must have been Kruger. Kruger Park. You would have definitely heard them. Yeah. Yeah. It was at Skakuza. Yeah, absolutely. But okay. when I was in forestry, we had twelve players, which we used to go and visit every night. So I heard them a lot. <clears throat> So you should be able to imitate them very well. But I won't make you. How about I introduce you and we get started? I think we've got quite, most of the people have gotten in here by now, um, gotten through the technology. So welcome everybody um, to another one of our virtual owl experts. Um, this has been a fantastic thing born out of the yuckiness of COVID because so many of us are staying home we work at the International Owl Center, which we are now in our fifth month of being closed. Um, so we had to come up with other ways of reaching people and still continuing to do education. And this has been a fantastic thing because we get to learn along with everybody else. Um, because there's a, a fantastic owl community around the world, of people that know so much and are willing to share their knowledge with the rest of us. So we're pleased that all of you are coming to join in with us. And if you don't or haven't heard about where we are before, the International Owl Center is located in the itty bitty town of Houston, Minnesota, less than a thousand people. And people always say, why do you have an International Owl Center out in the middle of nowhere in a little tiny town? And the answer is it just evolved here. We started with a nature center as the trailhead for the river bike trail. And I got Alice the Great Horned Owl as an education bird to start with that. If you hear hooting somewhere randomly in the background, that would be Alice. Um, she injured her wing when she was just a baby falling out of her nest. Bad enough, she would never be able to live in the wild. So in the United States, a bird that's non-releasable, that is um, of a disposition that's comfortable being around people, can get a job as an education bird. So Alice's job has been to teach people about owls. And she was so popular, we thought, hey, let's do a hatch day party for Alice in late, uh, late winter. She hatched somewhere the end of February, early March. We brought in some live owls. We did some fun family things. And the first year, 300 people showed up. For a town our size, that's a lot. Then we added more things and speakers and we added a World Owl Hall of Fame to recognize people who have done amazing things to make the world a better place for owls. Jonathan Haw is one of those winners. And pretty soon we started getting more than a thousand people coming to our town. And then we realized um, there's nobody else doing anything like this in North America and there's no other all owl education center in the United States. There's a wolf center, a bear center, a crane center, eagle center, but there was nothing, no center focused just on owl education. So we started that um, five and a half years ago. Um, so that's why we have an international owl center in a little town in the middle of nowhere. Um, so that's us and why we're here. Um, do check out our website, internationalowlcenter.org. You will find some stuff you maybe wouldn't have expected there. There's a section on owl conferences, which has links to past conferences, future conferences, conference proceedings. We have an e-newsletter um, that gives summaries of recent owl research that's been published. And if you are, if you are, oh, Jonathan, I think we're getting some feedback on yours. Could you mute for a second? 
There we go. There we go. Um, there's a section on education um, and we did an effective owl education techniques um, conference at a World Owl Conference um, in Portugal in 2017. And Jonathan was part of that. His transcript is on there, um, along with Raju Akaria from Nepal. Um, I'm trying to remember who else. We, the one from India is not quite complete yet. But anyway, there's information for educators there. There's information for researchers. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit on the website. Uh, but you're here to hear from Jonathan. He started owlproject.org, which you're going to hear about here about 20 years ago, um, in an effort to help deal with rats and negative cultural views about owls, and just done amazing things over the years, which is why he's one of our World Owl Hall of Fame award winners. He has been to Houston, Minnesota to receive his award, and I had the pleasure of going to South Africa to see firsthand the work that they're doing there, and it's absolutely amazing um, and the kids are amazing and I can see why he loves doing what he's doing because it visiting the kids that he was working with was maybe one of the highlights of my life absolutely amazing so I highly encourage everybody to support this project because it's fantastic um, so without further ado I can talk forever I'll let Jonathan talk for a while so I'll have you unmute yourself Jonathan and I'll mute myself and you can go to it Okay. Am I am I unmuted? Okay. I'm not as technologically sa as savvy as Carla is, so I don't know. Am I okay? Um, I'm going to start. Um, um, if any problems, I've got Carla there telling me that I'm live and I'm, I can go for it. I've I've. It's nine o'clock or half past nine at night here, so I've got a light on um, that is attracting a lot of insects. So if there's an odd moth that flies into my face and that kind of thing, it's 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 uh, fair enough. I was telling Carlo before we started that Alton John came to South Africa and he was playing his piano at Sun City with a lot of lights on him. And about half an hour into the show, he jumped up and stormed off because he had moths all over his face. So if that happens in this presentation, I'm not going to storm off, but primarily because I'm not Elton John, but um, just because we're going to try and see this thing through to the end. So <clears throat> I think what I do now is I go to my sh I go to my slideshow, or do I sc share screen first, and then I go to my slideshow. I think that's it, um, and then I click play. Carla, does that all look right? Okay, so um, this is it. This is my first slide, and this is a barn owl. I know you've had a couple of these talks already, and there's a lot of people on here that are, are definitely owl experts, so I'm just going to kind of go through this. And this is a barn owl, um, and the, the heading or the name of this talk is going to be See No Evil, because we're dealing with owl mythology in South Africa. So we're going to start, well, fairly far back. I'm not quite the beginning, but sort of the beginning. And just our relationship with, with owls, our relationship with barn owls um, can, can be traced back so far up to about two and a half million years. And this is borne out by um, paleontologists doing fossil work in the, the hills around here, the cradle of mankind, where Australopithecines and Mrs. Pless, people like that, or uh, Australopithecines like that were found. And in those caves, they were finding fossilized owl pellets. So not just bones of early hominids or Australopithecines or other species, but also fossilized owl pellets that were, were an indication that even these little Australopithecines, when they were throwing their bones outside their cave, they were encouraging rats, and rats encourage owls. It's pretty much as simple as that. So barn owls are found all over the world, apart from, I think, Antarctica. And um, they're really just, they, they, they're, they're rat rodent specialists. Um, so at this stage, we were already living with rats and with owls. Um, so it's been a long relationship that we've had. And obviously, you know, there's been, I don't know how Australopithecines viewed owls, but there's been a long mythological relationship that we've had with owls. They've never been a vague bird to us. They've always had some 
connection to either good or evil. And I don't know if it's the owl itself or whether it's um, possibly just that they're nocturnal. A lot of our mythological species or species that we're scared of are nocturnal. Bats, there's a lot of mythology about bats, there's a lot of mythology about cats. A lot of the nocturnal, and you know, for most of our history, we've basically been absolutely diurnal. So when the sun comes up, we get up. When the sun goes down, we go to sleep. And now, I mean, obviously there's electricity and there's light and there's all those things, so we're not as diurnal as we were. But in that existence of just living in the light, once it got dark, noises and sounds that we, we heard through the night were, were probably scary to us. And people who've never heard a barn owl, when they hear it for the first time, it can be quite an eerie call. So if you didn't know, if you don't know what it is and you hear that out at night and you've got no way of seeing or, or establishing what's making that sound, it could be quite um, frightening. So, you know, that might be the, the, the reason that we have these fears of, of these things. Um, but then we jump forward, you know, a lot, two and, two and a half million years, basically, and we're looking at Egypt. And Egypt had owl hieroglyphs. Um, you know, and even in this, I mean, the owl hieroglyph, they didn't have an owl god, the Egyptians, and owls that in the hieroglyph apparent or what appears were just there to indicate a letter. But one of the things about them, and all the other bird hieroglyphs, they've got, they, they have the bird um, profile, but only the owl has the profile with the owl's face turned 90 degrees to look at the viewer, which is unique to owls in Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, so even then, there was something different about the owl to, every, to everything else. And then moving on, we get to the, the, the ancient Greeks. And I mean, every, every civilization in a way has had some kind of owl mythology that, uh, in Babylon, places like that, there's owl mythology, the ancient Greeks. And this is where the wise owl concept comes from. I'm sure you've, you've attended these talks and a lot of people know this, but the, the wise old owl or the wise owl concept comes from ancient Greece. And it was actually, it was, it was the goddess Athena's totem. So she had an owl in some of the artwork and things of Athena. There was an owl on her shoulder, the little owl. I think the Latin name for the little owl is Athena. And um, that's where the wisdom of the owl came from. So it's never been a vague bird to anybody. It's always had some kind of um, importance, whether it be good or bad. <clears throat> And then we get to today, and this is where we are right now. It's a little different to that Australopithecine scene, but this is downtown Johannesburg. This is a township called Alexandra Township. It's in South Africa, we call these places townships. I know that in America, they've got a different idea of a township that, you know, there's places there called townships that are not this, but this is, this is the terminology for South African um, townships. And these were really, they started as a result of, bringing labor to work on gold mines in Johannesburg and, and in the cities. And in doing that, um, they, they were almost transient uh, residential environments. So people had come from other places who were working on gold mines, living in, in a place called Alexander and then going home whenever they got the chance or, or when they had leave or when they retired. And um, so they were never really home to anybody. But as time's got, time has gone by, they've become, uh, they've become sort of, uh, people are born and, and live and die in townships now. So they, they've become residential, but very highly, very densely populated areas um, and very little trees, as you can see. But, and also, you know, there's not a lot of, I mean, there is a little bit now, but there's not that much kind of house proudness there. So you don't see a lot of trees, you don't see a lot of gardening, you don't see a lot of those things. And service delivery in places like this is, is usually very poor. Uh, waste management is, is, is not good at all. And the consequence of all of that is very high numbers of rats. So just as when we were throwing bones outside our cave, we had rats in attendance and owls you know, catching those rats, exactly the same is happening in, in Alexandra Township. There were a very high population of, of rats and a very high population of owls. So there's also mythological fears um, in, in Africa. We have mythological fears that if an owl lands on your roof, somebody's going to die. It's very similar to Roman mythology, in fact. It's, it's funny that that mythology has come through from, for such a long time, the kind of the, the, that someone's going to die. And I've thought about that, and I've looked at 
at um, in rural areas and places like that without hospitals and where a lot of people die at home. The, generally, the, the, the time that, that we die, or, or you know, all species, whether it be owls or people or dogs or cats, is usually the, the, the last couple of hours of the night, just before when we struggle to maintain our body temperature. And that could be in villages where there's a death in a, in a crawl or in a hut or in a house, that there's activity. And in that activity, people bump into an owl sitting on the roof that's been sitting on the roof forever catching rats. But all of a sudden, they kind of put that whole thing together. And it's a, you know, we saw an owl, somebody died, and, and this is where it goes to. But so this is Alexander Township. And, and this is, a, a, this is a, a, you know, a South African way in the middle of the night an hour outside his window. And it's not just a, an ancient and archaic mythology that he's dealing with. In South Africa, we also have very current um, owl, not mythologies as such, but, but you know, um, well, there are mythologies, but they're current. They're, they're witchcraft. Owls are associated in this country with witchcraft and current witchcraft, not ancient witchcraft. So this guy wakes up and we go now into traditional healers. Traditional healers are, are a vital part of the South African economy. And also, you know, they're, they're, a lot of them are highly trained and very effective. Um, they, they work with muti, which is a, 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 an African word for plant. And they, they've, um, they're, very, they're very good. Many of them are very good at what they do. But they were classified as, they were, you know, while most countries around the world were repealing their witchcraft acts, South Africa during apartheid in, I think, 1952 was actually, you know, making it stronger. They were adding things to the witchcraft act. It was, if you try to curse somebody, you could go to jail, you could do all those things. So witchcraft really lent on traditional healers at that time. Now with the end of apartheid, traditional healers are emerging into the light with all the benefits of traditional healers and also some of the, the, the not so healthy aspects of traditional healing. Um, or, you know, sangomas as they call them here. <clears throat> so at the moment, traditional healers are lobbying to be accepted as health professionals in this country where they could um, write scripts and possibly also book people off sick leave, things like that. And there's, there's a lot of concern about that because nobody wants to be in a situation where somebody's booked off work for two weeks because they heard an owl calling outside their window. So there's, there's potential financial implications for those kinds of, of so it's a, it's a debate, an ongoing debate in this country, <clears throat> but they're definitely here and they're definitely of value. Um, and, we wanted to base, we wanted to look at traditional healers and find out what their relationships or their relationship with owls really was. So that was the first part of this project was trying to establish that. So this is a picture of a of a muti market. This is in Faraday Street in downtown Johannesburg, and I think it's the biggest muti market in South Africa. Um, and it appeals to all of these. Uh, you know, there's also a lot of people in in Johannesburg that come from other countries and they have different. Um, traditional medicinal needs and requirements. They want different things. So this appeals to a whole lot of people. Um, you can see in the front, there's a whole lot of birds of prey, skins of birds of prey lying on the ground. There's a leopard skin attached to the pole. Um, and, and, and this is, you know, people come in here and they buy things that they need, uh, bits of things or potions or all sorts of things. And, and this is a, a very lively and busy market. And here's a traditional healer. I mean, a lot of these traditional healers are very impressive. You know, they have a real sense of presence about them. And they train. They go off into the mountains. They learn about plants. They learn about herbs and all sorts of things. And they, um, they, they, a lot of them are, are very interesting and fascinating and knowledgeable. So what we wanted to look at was who uses traditional healers. And that's quite interesting in South Africa because it's not... <clears throat> it's not um, you know, there's, there's not a demographic that you would expect because, you know, since the end of apartheid, there's been a, a lot more available education for a larger percentage of the population or majority of the population. But just because kids are going to school and going to university, their parents often didn't. And in many respects, their parents might well have used traditional medicine and the kid now is an accountant or a lawyer or not so often a doctor, but those kind of professions, a policeman, a member of parliament, and they still will use traditional healers 
for ailments and things that they have. Now, some of these traditional healers, they they uh, they they can they they're pretty remarkable. Not just the, the the ones who cure things with plants, but the other guys that can solve any problem. And these are the kind of flyers they put out. They hand out. They all call themselves doctor, and they hand out these fly, flyers. And they make reasonable money with these things. And if you look at some of the things they do, you know they can they can bring back lost lovers. They can make, help you sleep. They can uh, help people win the lotto, win the casino, horse win a horse, or I think it's horse racing. They can. Do you want any kind of revenge? And and people give them money to carry out these things. You want a job. You want a promotion at work. Um, destroy Tokolosh from your from your home. Now Tokolosh is a is a mythical character. It's a very short kind of demon that comes into your house at night and causes mischief. I don't quite know what that I can't remember what that mischief was. But when I was a kid, um, a lot of people would actually put their beds on bricks so that their bed was higher than the Tokolosh could reach. So he couldn't get to them. So there were a lot of beds on bricks in those days. I haven't seen it that much now but this is this is one of those things so these guys offer all of these fixes to any problem you might have and when it comes to things like revenge and that kind of thing this is where normal muti or white muti which is the healing and cleansing muti turns to black muti and this is where owls start to play a part so here's a, a typical this is black muti. Here's a tin that a guy found in his garden. And in that tin was stuffed a whole lot of things and buried in this bloke's garden. He found it. Interestingly enough, he paid a, a Sangoma, I think about 40,000 Rand, which is the equivalent to about three and a half, four thousand uh, dollars to, to take this curse off. But in that tin, you can see there's an owl head wrapped in cotton. Um, there's a, a, some money, some old money, so that you won't be able to keep money, you won't be able to hang on to money. There's a broken knife, which all of these things have significance. And then a traditional healer or a sangoma or somebody like that will come in and, and remove this curse, but at great expense. And often, I mean, obviously, when you're having a curse removed, having it removed is a great relief, but you ideally want it placed back on the person who placed it onto you. So you pay a little extra for that. But at least you know that whoever cursed you is, is now cursed himself. So this is this is the kind of the situation, and this is where owls fit in. So we did a we did a questionnaire to traditional uh, medicine or traditional healers at Faraday Street, and it was very difficult to get answers out of them because they've historically been victimized by old South African government policemen and. You know, at some stages, they've been raided. Um, I know at some point there was actually human remains confiscated from. So, I mean, this is Africa. So we, we that's how we, we go. But they didn't want to talk to us. It was very difficult to get answers out of a lot of these guys. But eventually we got 70 of them to answer our questionnaire. And it was simple. It was just owl related. It was, um, do you use owls? What species do you use? How many do you use? Do you know what an owl is? Do you know what it does out in the wild? And the res responses were very interesting. Um, so basically, this was the questionnaire. Some of the things that were interesting about it was you know, the amounts of money. There was a guy there who was saying that he'll 20,000 Rand to take off a cure. They were up to 5,000 Rand, 10,000 Rand. But the majority of them knew that owls ate rats. They all knew that owls played a part in the environment and, and ate rats. Um, they were getting, mostly they were getting dead owls in. And the species of owls that they were getting in were, well, this is the supply and demand. They were, you know, basically, all of those tables were using about 70 owls a month. Okay, that was moving through those tables, which was very different to a visit or a couple of visits I did 15 years ago when I went to look at these places because um, there, there were owls on tables, but they were there for long periods of time. The turnover was very slow, and it looks as if now the turnover is much quicker. And that might be because when I went there 15 years ago, nobody wanted to really show me anything, or the fact that um, there's more people in Johannesburg that come from different parts of Africa who are all now 
going to these traditional healers. They're not on medical aid. They can't go to the hospitals because they're not legally. So a lot of them are not legally in this country. So they don't, they can't go to a government hospital. So they're visiting the, the, the Faraday Street markets and traditional healers. But there were a couple of specialists who just dealt with owls on these tables, which was also interesting. So the, the species that we found on these tables predominantly, I mean, there were a couple of things, that, there was a grass owl and there were a couple of other owl species, but predominantly it was spotted eagle owl, barn owl and marsh owl. And the, 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 the reality of that is those are probably the three most, um, the th three species that are most affected by road accidents or collisions with cars on, on roads. And that, so they were being picked up. And often when you looked at some of those owl skins, you'd find where they'd been hit by a car, wing was broken, that kind of thing. So a lot of them were actually just roadkill collections that were finding their way into these markets. In Faraday Street, there are 417 tables, the majority were plant species. 60 of those tables had bird species on them. And of that 60, 90% had an owl or parts of an owl present. In one table, there were two live barn owls. And that was one of the questions the guys answered saying that they paid more for live owls. Obviously live owls had more value to them, but it didn't seem as if they got live owls in very often. So in light of all of that, you would think that owls didn't have any legal protection in South Africa, but they definitely do. And they have good legal protection. Our constitution's good and our wildlife legislation is good. So they're protected in South Africa. Um, they require permits to be kept, you, permits to transport, and th there is the legal protection for them. But the problem here is that the enforcement of that protection is virtually non-existent. Um, there are a couple of reasons. <clears throat> the conservation staff that we have are, are often those departments are very understaffed and in many cases very undertrained as well. But and, and additionally, you know, owls and traditional healing, I'm not saying that the conservation staff use these tables personally, but a lot of the policemen do, a lot of members of parliament do. So there's a kind of an acceptance of them. And finally, owls are not rhinoceros. I mean, I, I, you know, they're not a high flying conservation effort that's globally recognized where people are putting lots of money into protecting rhinoceros and, and, and looking out for rhinoceros also and have that sort of status. So the, the legal protection doesn't really help them much. So back to this bloke. Um, so <laughs> what he does then is he picks up the phone and he phones either the SBCA or he phones the um, owlproject.org or he phones his local councillor and that's where owlproject.org gets involved in this part of Township Owls. Okay, Now, this is actually more of a, a dealing with a, a symptom rather than a cause. So we deal with these things and we get involved in these things, but it's not really our major focus. It's just something that we do because it's a lot of community awareness. It's nice to be, I mean, and we look at our calls over the years and they've gone from when we first started to seven calls a year to now to up to sometimes 400 calls a year, just because more and more people are aware of us and aware of what we do. And they've passed that number on by, you know, nature conservation, SBCAs, <clears throat> municipalities. So once he gives us a ring, this is Delina but the owl mobile with an owl in the window races into the township. Uh, is Delina talking to a couple of kids there and goes to his house. And invariably in these places, we've got owls that have got in under the a broken fascia board or they've got into the ceiling and they're raising chicks in there. We get up onto the roof. Our first prize in this situation is to speak to the owner to dissect a few owl pellets with him, show him how many rats are being eaten, because in townships, rats are a huge problem. So, you know, the, the correlation between owls and rats isn't often there. And by illustrating that correlation, we, 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 people, they might not like owls, or they might be scared of owls, but they hate rats, because rats are a real problem in their environment. So we'll get onto the roof, and this is what we often come across. The interesting thing about this picture is this is inside a, a guy's roof in Alex in Alexander Township. You can see there's two owls that have hatched and there's a third egg hatching. But the size of this clutch, if you count the two that are hatched, you're looking at 10 owls in this in this nest. And that's a large clutch for barn owls. And I mean, barn owls are able to regulate their breeding to deal with rodent 
explosions or eruptions or high rodent numbers. And this is what you see in townships all the time. You see, we've had up to 15 baby owls in a, in a nest just because there's so much available food. So this is what we're confronted with. Now in a situation like this, there's nothing we can do except convince this guy to give it some time to wait the 30 days until the chicks have hatched. And then when the chicks have hatched and they're movable, and often we do that. Often the guy's just happy to have someone talking to them, explaining to them what it is, telling them not to worry, and we can solve it. And they'll wait that 30 days until the chick, all the eggs have hatched and the chicks are, I mean, to remove this, would just the owls would be back in there within two weeks and start laying eggs again, or if we excluded them, this whole clutch would be in jeopardy. So we leave them at this stage. And then when they're older and we can remove owls from the roof, we'll open that roof up and we'll remove these owls. I mean, this is another nest altogether. This is a whole lot of young owls, also a very big clutch, young owls. And when they're this age, we can take them, we can put them into a carry case. This is Hussein. Hussein, I'm not sure if he's the only black ringer in South Africa, but I'm, 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 I, it wouldn't surprise me. And strangely enough, I mean, Hussein is very good, you know, very good at talking to people, very likable, um, but he must have put rings on, I would guess, maybe 2,000 owls at this stage, and barn owls in these places, because all of these owls get rings so we can see where they pitch up. So he'll collect them. Obviously, kids gather, you know, and they, the, the lean is out there chatting to people, gathering the crowds about the owls. He'll chat to the kids, give them a talk, um, show them the baby owls. And here's the homeowner while Hussein puts a ring on the owl. He, he doesn't, this picture doesn't look like he's totally convinced to me, but maybe it's, just, maybe it's just the picture. So they put rings on the owls, show all the kids, and then they climb up and they put an owl box on the roof, invariably off the guy's house. He just wants them out of the ceiling. And they place these young owlets in the roof and the parents are in there at dusk, raising and feeding these chicks. And then they fledge, and these boxes, we've had some boxes like this that have been occupied for the last eight or nine years, where every year we go around, we put rings on the chicks in the box, and there you go, there's another box with a little owl chicken, and not a very nice picture, but that's pretty much what we do. And in some places we'll go off and um, if there's an open field or a park or something like that, we'll install an owl box on a gun pole. One of the things, if we're in a situation where um, the guy really doesn't want the owls and he doesn't want them on his roof and he doesn't want them anywhere near him, then we'll take those young owls and we put them into our school program. And the school program is schools in these areas where the children will put them into a release box and they'll hack them using the peregrine fun technique of hacking. They'll feed them every day, they'll whistle, they'll call, and they'll open that box and let those chicks fledge from that box as close to the, the actual house as possible. Um, but also schools are good. They're, they're quiet at night. They've got playing fields in a very highly populated area like that. Any open area is good for owls to fledge. And the kids also, they become sort of custodians of those owls. And it's very three-dimensional learning for them. They're, they're coming in on Sunday to feed owls. In fact, I, I mean, obviously the headmasters of these schools are very important, but I had a headmaster phone me once and say to me, um, you must expect a call from my wife. And I said, well, why would your wife be phoning me? And he said, she doesn't believe that I'm getting out of bed at three o'clock in the morning to go and feed the owls at the school, you know? And I said, well, you don't have to leave, feed them at three o'clock in the morning, just as long as it's still dark is good, you know? So anyway, they get very involved. And the, the headmasters of schools that have participated in this project have been wonderful. I mean, they're the ship's captain. They drive this thing and they make it work. And so, I mean, so those kids will raise those owls, feed them until they're fledging, open the the, the, the release box, or sometimes the release box opened from the beginning, and then continue support feeding those owls for sometimes a month, sometimes two or three months, until they start hunting. And we often find that in the pellets. The pellets change color, and we can see that they're now starting to, to, to eat rats. This is just a fascinating photo. This is a, an owl nest in Alex that I think had 11 owlets in it. Um, so the female had got into this between a wall space and she'd laid 11 eggs. I don't know what, I think there was an egg in there. So she, maybe she laid 12 and 11 of them hatched. And this is them all at about 28, 30 days old. And we went and we looked at them packed in there like sardines. And they just, they all fledged. We went back and there was four in there. Then there was one in there. Then the, so they all fledged from 
from um, this particular nest. Okay, so once we've done all that, we collect all the owl pellets from these nests, um, from the roofs, from um, you know boxes that are occupied, and here's a whole lot of owl pellets that we put coordinates on, uh, where they've come from, and we weigh them. Okay, and the reason we weigh them is to 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 get an idea of it's quite an easy extrapolation. It's not absolute. But if we can weigh one owl pellet, and we know that it's got a rat skull in it, and we can weigh 10 kgs of owl pellets, we can kind of work out how many rats are being consumed at that box or at that site over a certain period of time, whenever we collect the pellets. So kids help us with this, and they end up with an idea of, of actually how fantastic barn owls are at controlling rats, at, at consuming rats. How, I mean, a baby, those little chicks you saw, they come out of the egg, and 35 days later, they're sort of 30 days later, 30 to 35 days later, they're fully grown. So they're eating more than their parents. And they just eat, scoff those rats. I mean, I, I will take a young owl and give it one of those big Norwegian roof rats. And the kids won't believe that the owl's going to eat it. And it'll sit there for 30 minutes, kind of chugging this thing down until it's just got the tail sticking out of its mouth. And these kids are in disbelief. And when I tell them that that's very impressive, but the reality of it is that owl will do exactly that again in four or five hours from now. So it's very, it, they're very interested in this. So we weigh all these pellets and then we put them in bottles. So barn owl with the coordinates that we put a couple of pellets in each bottle and we send them off into the education aspect of owlproject.org. And this is, this, I mean, to date, 260,000 children have participated in owlproject.org, and this is how it happens. They, they get a key, they get a little bottle of coordinates, they get a couple of owl pellets, and they dissect those owl pellets. I mean, we're so used to seeing people with masks and gloves. It feels like this is a, a post-COVID picture, but actually, it's a pre-COVID picture. So all these kids dissect these pellets, and then they take a picture of what they've got in their Petri dish. And in that way, we, we get those pictures, we get, they put everything back in the bottle, it gets stored and gets collected. And if we see a picture of something that's interesting to us, a bird skull or something we haven't seen before, a bat skull, we'll then call for that particular bottle and have a look at it. So all of these kids are busy dissecting owl pellets, um, seeing what owls eat. And this just goes on and on across schools, across uh, um, provinces all over South Africa, we've got kids going through this program, looking at these keys and dissecting owl pellets. Uh, it, it's schools and townships, it's schools that are normal suburban schools in Johannesburg. And I mean, these are kids just sitting on the floor doing owl pellet dissections. So all of that data we collect, um, we store all of that. I think it's the largest owl pellet dissection project in definitely in South Africa, definitely a citizen science project in South Africa. And all three kids, kids manage all of this and, and, and um, undertake all of this. And then once they've finished the program, whether it's been releasing owls from their school, whether it's been doing owl pellet dissections, they get a, a kind of certificate and they become owl ambassadors. I think this is a school that you went to, Carla. This is, um, I think you went to Marlborough Gardens with all those kids. This is, these are those kids. Um, and they take that certificate home and, and they're, 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 we believe at this point that most of these kids are owl friendly. And I mean, most kids are owl friendly around the world, but in South Africa, that's a little bit more difficult to achieve. And the beauty of this is these kids go home and they actually educate their parents. So it's a sort of bottom up education program because a lot of their parents didn't get the schooling that they're getting and are very love the fact that their children are in school and kind of hang on their every word. So these kids go off and educate their parents. And these are their parents, actually. Um, these are their parents doing an owl pellet dissection course themselves, sitting there, looking at what owls eat. OK, and this was Austria. Owlproject.org went to Austria. We do a whole lot of talks to kids there at schools in Austria. And these are kids in Austria dissecting uh, owl pellets. And these were, these were a whole lot of kids at schools in Austria doing a Skype presentation with kids in Alexander Township. It was a lovely morning, 
talking about owls, talking about climate issues, South African climate issues compared to Austrian climate issues. The African kids did a dance and a song and all sorts of things for the Austrian kids. And a lot of them, as far as I know, when I left that school, there were all these uh, Facebook friendships starting from between countries. And so they're very involved. Okay, so that's that. The, the, one of the things that we were confronted with in this project was the fact that because of the, 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 the stigma attached to owls, that in most, we've got 11 official languages in this country, and in most of those languages, owls, there was only one name for owls. So even though there's 12 species of owls in South Africa, in Zulu, owls were called Isikova, in, uh, in Sutu or, or Pedi, owls were called Lerubishi. And so that was whether it was a pearl spotted owl that's the size of a, a, a you know, this size, or a, a Vero eagle owl, which is the largest owl in Africa and, and is a meter high. So they all would just had one name, which isn't helpful for kids who actually want to, you know, to you want to be able to to learn different species and identify different species and have a name for different species before you can really start appreciating them. So these kids got together and then renaming or then naming, they're giving uh, their natural native tongue names to all of our owl species. And this has been a wonderful, wonderful program. And here they are looking at different owls. They've got to kind of keep it real. So they can't just come up with, you know, um, definitely not scary owl, you know, none of those things, but they've actually got to read up about the owl, find out who it is and or find out what it is and then give a name that's appropriate to it. And I try to load a sound bite on here, but unfortunately I'm not that technologically advanced. And the, 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 one of the owls that they, I mean, these all these kids working on these sheets and then they submit to where all the schools that are involved submit the names and they submit the, they submit the names that they've come up with. You'll still see Yosikova, but now you've got an addition to it. Um, and I mean, the pearl spotted owlet, um, they've come out and there's a sound clip on our website that you go and listen to all of these names of these kids in these different languages. And Pearl Spotted Owl has come up with, it's just beautiful. And it's, they've called it the Little Pearl. And they're just wonderful names that kids all over this country are coming up with for owls. And I'm hoping that in time, these names will be in our next uh, bird books where you've got those generic names in the 11 official languages. The reason I'm showing you this picture is because it takes us into what we're heading into now. So this is an owl box. Those are three spotted eagle owlets sitting in that box. But, and I know you're drawn to those three owlets. I mean, that's what you're looking at. But what I'd like you to look at is that opening. So that's a piece of wood. All of these boxes are made with recycled product. So that opening for that door is just a cutout. We cut that out of a piece of wood in the workshop and we take that cutout away. We had a whole lot of these cutouts. So we wanted the kids to, to, to do some owl art. There was an idea a few years ago to do owl art and attach it to the fences of their schools to let all the passerbyers and Alex know that they were owl friendly and they did this art and there was a, 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 a very famous um, local celebrity that came to judge. I, she wasn't, I didn't know who she was, but all the kids knew who she was. And so, these were the owl cutouts. And this has launched the owl art program, <clears throat> which has just been fantastic. I mean, this is owl art on the floor of our workshop before a show. So there were a whole lot of schools that participated and it's evolved over the years from those little wooden cutouts where the kids just painted directly onto those, which you can see here that they attached to all their school fences. I think we did, um, I think it was about a thousand of these and these kids painted them all put them on the school fence and there you go up on the wall a lot of a lot of activity and excitement and they were judged and there were some prizes to be won and the following year there's that same shape from that owl box we cut out little owls and we gave them to kids and, and they put them together and colored them in and here's a whole lot of kids coloring in owls for their owl project um i know carla you've seen them you've seen this and it, it just, uh, it's been fantastic. I mean, this particular owl thing, we did more. So we, we did about two and a half thousand of these little owls. And there they are with their, their painted owls or their colored in owls. I think even their teachers colored in a few owls. 
<laughs> anyway, so, and that's what they look like. And there's a couple at the International Owl Center. There's a couple in Austria. Um, there's a couple in Nepal that are all over the place. Uh, these little owls that these kids in a township in Alexander in South Africa have painted. And these are them. I mean, there's there's thousands of kids that have participated. These are some of them. And at the end of this slideshow or PowerPoint, um, I'd like to switch over to a video that they did for Christmas. It's not this year because a lot of these schools have not been open for a large portion of this year. But it's it's just these kids wishing everyone happy Christmas. And I'm sure they'd really like me to play it for you, even though it's a couple of years old. And there's their art, just totem poles and totem poles of kids' art from all over townships around this country. And there's some of the kids posing with their art. And this was the year that we did masks. We did a lot of wooden cut out masks and the kids were painting their masks and wearing their masks around for the day. And this has been, I mean, the, 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 these kids are, are, I mean, we've been doing this project for 20 years. And so some of the kids that started with us in Seba King and places like that 20 years ago are now adults and have kids of their own. And we did a, uh, the, the, this project won an award from a television station and they interviewed, I said, well, why don't you try and find one of those kids and interview them? And they found this little girl that was in this original program that we did. And she's now a, a woman with kids, she's a beautician. And they asked her about the project and she said the project for her taught her that if she was scared of anything, she just needed to find out more about it. And I think that's really what this project, the essence of this project is kids just dealing with the fact that Owls are there to eat rats and not much else. And we don't think much of rats, so let owls get on and do what they do. And here's just more owl art. I mean, we've got just boxes and boxes and boxes of beautiful, beautiful owl art. And then they put on, a, they put on shows at the Bird Life Fair. These kids are there. They put up their posters from what schools they come from. They put up all their owl art there. These are, this is what they did last year. They all got together and they did these kind of three-dimensional owl pieces that they put together. I think I know, Carla, one was posted to you and you haven't got it. We're going to have to dig into that and try and find out what happened to your, your owl. Um, but so this is it. And then, I mean, I know that I'm, I'm Carla, you must start doing things like stop, stop. You've gone on for too long. So, but one of the things in South Africa is we have taxi drivers and taxi drivers, are, they're kind of, they're, they're, they, um, they're, they're difficult. They're tricky. They drive really badly. They, they travel very quickly and they, they, they usually cause people a lot of aggravation. And, but we thought we would, there would be a good place to put bumper stickers on taxis in South Africa saying owls eat rats, which is, so when we thought about it, we thought it would be difficult, but it was so easy. We went to these taxi ranks, Delina went, I think um, Tompo went, uh, Hussein went, and we, they spoke to these taxi drivers. And what was interesting is that some of the taxi drivers had kids that had participated in the Township Owl Project or owlproject.org at their school. So this started, that this was a newspaper article about it, this taxi driver there with this owls eat rat sticker. And the message is really that simple, you know, for everyone, it's just owls eat rats. And there's uh, another sticker going up on a taxi. I think there's about 200 taxis now that have these stickers on and we just run out of stickers. So we've, you know, we've got to carry on with that. This was a taxi in India. When we went to the owl conference in Pune in India, these were a taxi that putting owl stickers, owl eat rat stickers from South Africa on their taxi in India. So it's those stickers are really kind of getting out there. And then this was a collaboration with Rats, which is, a, uh, is an American organization that does fantastic work, anti uh, poison, anti-redenticide work in America. They're changing a lot of laws and rules and things. And this is uh, in collaboration with them. They designed this poster, but we changed it to the 11 official African or the, the African languages in South Africa. And we've put it up in townships all over the place. It's a beautiful poster. And it, it's got the OWL project and the, the, the RATS logo on it. And this is in, I think this is in Zulu, but they're all over places for kids to read and, and have a look and see that. Um, this is our message. And then finally, obviously with all these kids, we do questionnaires. We, we ask them questions. Do you think owls are scary? Do you think they can be used for medicine? Do you think they can, um, do you think they're good for nature? And these kids answer these questionnaires. We had about 2,000 children answer, answer these questionnaires. And we compared children who had participated in this project uh, a year before. So it wasn't that current that had a year to kind of 
you know, absorb it or, or digest it and kids who hadn't participated at all. And the results were fascinating. They were, the kids who had participated were, they, you know, owls were, couldn't be used for mooty, owls were not scary, owls were good for the environment. The kids who hadn't participated, their answers weren't the same. The discrepancy was huge. But what was very interesting about this is we sent that questionnaire home to the parents. A lot of the parents of kids who hadn't participated didn't answer the questionnaire. And of the kids who had, I've got the figures, I think we sent 950 home and we got 800 answers, which was pretty good. Um, they were also owl friendly. So these kids had gone home, and that was one of the things about a project like this. I mean, we deal with mythology. So all of the kids that participate in this project need to get a letter of consent signed from their parents. And as far as I know, we haven't had any kid come to school and said, oh, my parents refused to sign the letter of consent. So they're convincing their parents they want to be involved. And the reason we do the letter of consent is because of this mythological fear. The last thing we want is, you know, a kid who's done this project and his dad doesn't win the lotto and blames the fact that his son was doing an owl pellet dissection the day before. So, but these parents are, are, um, are owl friendly, just as their kids are. And, and it's remarkable. I mean, the, the, the project is, is, is getting out there and obviously it's, it's, it's had some fantastic recognition from awesome organizations. This is BirdLife, the, the BirdLife Eagle Owl Award was um, awarded to the work done on owlproject.org. Um, very nice. Um, we've attended conferences. This was the World Conference in Portugal. There's Carla's where I met Carla. Um, and uh, uh, Satish and Raju talking about, uh, you know, our, our, our project and, and those projects. Very nice to get the word out there internationally about the work that we're doing. This was the Owl Award from the International Owl Center in Houston. And um, I, I had a little less hair then. I was wondering whether I should have worn a hat for this presentation. But anyway, there it is. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Hein, again. It was a wonderful experience for me. And it was the first time I saw snow, which was fantastic, and lots of snow. And very nice. There were owl cookies. It was like an owl. It was an owl week. And it was just, it was just fantastic. Um, there's Ingrid, Dr. Ingrid Cole does a lot of work for us around the world at conferences presenting the OWL project. She's been to the, the, the townships as is Carla, and she's seen the work they do there, and she's a great supporter of the work that we do. And this was the OWL conference in India, um, where we were present, where we presented two papers on the work that we do, and there was a lot of the kids' OWL art. There's, there's those masks and OWL, OWL things all over the, at the conference and throughout the um, that that area Pune. Um, and finally, I'm winding it up now. So obviously, Jane Goodall has been a firm supporter of what we do. And whenever she comes to South Africa, she tries to get to see what we're up to. And she's been very supportive of the work done at ourproject.org. And but at the end of the day, this has really just been about children with a little bit of owl. You know, so it's about kids growing up with an appreciation of things that are beneficial to them and learning awe and, and things like that for, for species. That, and this is what one of the headmasters at the school said to me once when I was asking him to, to you know, tell me what he thought of this program. And he said, most of the kids in these poor areas or in townships, they don't raise cats or dogs or budgies or parrots. They don't have any pets. Invariably, some of them are parentless homes where 12 year olds are raising their five year old sister. And so they don't have any uh, they don't they don't learn to nurture anything other than themselves and their very closest family and through the owl programs and owl releases and feeding owls he thought that it was teaching kids to nurture species other than their own species which i thought was a very powerful answer um but anyway these are them kids owls these are a whole lot of kids peering at some barn owls that have just come out of a roof i'm convinced these are going to be the next environmental um Ministers, there's a potential environment, South African environmental minister in there somewhere. I hope to see that. And that's pretty much the project. Um, yeah, that's it. Our project. That's that's it. I think have I have I have I have I pulled it off? Oh, no, have I done an hour? Absolutely perfect. Do you want to show the video?
Ah, yes, I'd like to show this video. I might, I'm sorry if I make a, uh, a mess of this. So I'm going to try this. This is a lot of kids put this video together for Christmas. So they'd really like me to show it. Um, so what, do I stop share? I can't seem to get my mouse to work. Um, okay, I stop share and then I reshare. Sorry. And then I push play. Does that look good, Carla? Can you give me a thumbs up on that? I think the audio is playing, but the video is not. The video is not playing. Sorry, Carla, you said the video is not playing. The audio was playing, but the video was not. Let me try and fix that if I can. We had it playing earlier, didn't we? Um, let me try and fix that right now. Sorry. Can you... Um... Okay, so... I'm going to go here. Is that work? Sorry about that. I think that's a fantastic way to end. Those kids are just so amazing that you work with there. And of course, obviously what you're doing with them is fantastic. Um, so we're gonna have a Q&A now. So those of you who are in Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A that you can type questions into. Um, and if we have some good questions over on YouTube, we'll have some folks that can bring those questions over to us into Zoom also. And Joe and I are going to alternate asking questions of Jonathan. Um, and if we don't, there's a chance we may not have a time to answer all the questions, but we'll just kind of keep going until Jonathan has had it. We, and we'll ask him to invitate lots of owl calls, right? Oh, I was hoping that wasn't going to happen. Joe, do you want to start off? Yeah, someone asks, how is the project, uh, the program funded? Um, well, at this stage, I mean, we do have, we've, we've had uh, support from International Owl Center. 
we've had support from um, some donors, but the project is, is actually, there's a company called Eco Solutions that does environmental work in South Africa, and they, uh, this is kind of almost their social responsibility project. So they've been funding the project for the last, since, since the beginning. But it's very, um, it's tricky because it's, it has its ups and downs, you know, when, we, when we're able to, we can, when Eco Solutions is able to, it does. When it when it can't it can't but that's pretty much how it how it goes. And full disclosure, <clears throat> who runs Eco Solutions that supports this? <laughs> well, I love this project, Connor. I mean, I I don't know. So I look at it. It's it's sometimes what it's what gets me to go to work. You know, I mean, if I've had a bad day at the office, all I need to do is just drive through to one of these schools and chat to kids and you know it's 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 good it's good for me and it's good for everybody who works at eco solutions too it's it's good for us so basically what we're down to is <clears throat> jonathan through his business is mostly funding this so all donations are very appreciated and really help with this because in in South Africa, it's all about the big five. It's about, let's see if I can remember, lions, leopards, rhinos, elephants, and Cape buffalo, and AIDS. People aren't giving money to owl things in South Africa. So um, I think primarily most of the donations that have come in have come in from outside of South Africa. So I highly recommend and personally myself support this project. Um, so in the chat box, I believe we have a link posted where you can see, go to owlproject.org, find out more about what they're doing, and there's links to make donations. So for those of us in other countries, the PayPal link um, is probably the best one for making donations, but they do have other giving options also. So I personally highly recommend supporting this because it's just win-win. It's great for the kids. It's great for owls. It's great for the environment. It's probably not good for rats, but otherwise it's, it's great for everything. Um, another question for you. How tall in centimeters or inches is the female horned owl, the, the spotted eagle owl in South Africa? Um, I really don't know. I should know. There was a time that I would know. But I, I would say, um, so I, I really don't know. I, I, there's a book here, I'm sure, somewhere in my office. But I would imagine... Um, I'd say, uh, what is that, 40 centimeters? That would be my, my 40 centimeters, yeah. I think, what's 40 centimeters? Yeah, I'd say about 40 centimeters. Maybe a little bit less, but, but about that size. Not as big as your great horned owl or any of those, those owls, but probably similar to the other, the, the other one you have. The barred owl? No, which, don't you have a, um, oh, you'll know better. I don't know if there's a, yeah. I think it's somewhere in the ballpark of a barred owl. It looks like a shrunk down great horned. Yeah, they look very similar. Yeah, just smaller. But that's what you find as you get closer to the equator, species generally are smaller. Even with barn owls, if you look at our barn owls compared to your barn owls or Siberian barn owls, our barn owls weigh, I don't really know about sizes too much, but in terms of weights, our barn owls weigh 400 grams. You get barn owls in, in Russia that weigh almost a kg. So as you get closer to the equator, species are smaller. And as you get closer to the pole, species get better. I think it's all to do with temperature thermoregulation. How did you get interested in owls? I don't, I don't, that's a, that's a strange question. I don't really know. I just remember that when I was a kid growing up in Zimbabwe and we went anywhere, I was always looking out the window and the things that struck me that were always the most interesting to me, strangely enough, were secretary birds. I just loved seeing secretary birds. I didn't really care too, I mean, lions were great, elephants were big, but secretary birds really worked for me. So I used to count them all the way from one town to the next, how many secretary birds. And that was it, it was just birds of prey. And at some stage, people started bringing me little boxes of owls that had fallen out of a roof or things that had fallen out of a tree. And, and it, it, it kind of, it worked. So from 10, I think, 
I sort of, yeah, I don't really know what it was though. Could you please tell us more about Pell's fishing owls? What makes them so unique? Why this particular diet? Pell's fishing owl. Well, I mean, Pell's fishing owl, are, are, they, we get them here. Um, they're not that common, actually. I think there's a nice project being run by Endangered Wildlife Trust on Pell's fishing owl. But they, obviously, they eat fish. And they eat some other things, too. You know, they'll eat crabs and they'll eat all sorts of things. But they eat fish. Um, but there's a few fishing owls around the world. You know, very interesting, uh, you know, big nests, big birds, very pretty, very, a very nice sound at night. You find them through the Okavango. Um, I know Heinz collecting feathers. I'm really looking forward to seeing what he comes up with. I can't wait for that project to, or that uh, research to come out, because that would be very interesting. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about how they're different from regular owls? Well, how are they different from just that they eat fish? Is that, is there, are there more differences? I know they're big and I know they're kind of orange and I know they eat fish, but what are the, what are the other differences with them? Have they got, they've got different feet. I imagine they've got feet for catching fish. So they've got barbs on, their, on the inside of their feet for catching fish, like all the fishing owls would have. So the, the, the kind of foot structure is different. Um, they don't have feathers yeah. on the toes, do they? No feathers on the toes? I don't think they have feathers on the toes either, yeah. And they don't I mean, have there's some owls that I know so intimately because I've been exposed to so, you know, those owls for such a long time. But Pell's fishing owl, I've, I've only ever seen Pell's fishing owl twice. And that was in the Okavango Delta. So they're not common here. And I mean, you know, uh, I'd probably be better at answering questions about barn owls or spotted eagle owls or maybe wood owls, but I'm not going to do any calls. I know you, before we started, there was a whole let's do owl calls. I, I, I'm, I recognize their calls immediately when I hear them. I just can't mimic them. When people phone our office and say, there's an owl in my garden, I always say, what does it sound like? And then cover the phone so they can't hear me laughing as they make the call that they think the owl sounds like. So I'm not going to be that guy. Uh, is there anywhere we can read your publications on the project to learn more? Uh, was any of it published in peer-reviewed journals? Well, at this stage, this is really like a citizen science program, but there's lots and lots of data out there. Um, there's the pellet dissection data. There's... Um, and there's a lot of stuff on our website. In terms of publishing, you know, we presented at, at our conferences and that sort of thing. But um, I suppose all the people who work at Eco Solutions all have degrees and are planning to do their honors or planning to do their masters. And so we've collected this wealth of data that um, hopefully will be published at some point. Okay, um, this is someone from the US. Uh, when we use owl pellets, we bake them to sterilize them before we give them to kids. You've chosen to use masks and gloves instead and wondering why you did that. Um, I know they do it in the States and places like that, they bake them and they sterilize them. You know, I don't, I don't know whether we could do that. We do, we deal with such a large number of owl pellets and such a lot of, you know, so many kids dissecting them. And also with the masks and, I mean, I don't know even that the masks and the gloves are necessary. You know, I've been pulling pellets apart my whole life and, and, and I've never had any kind of problems with it. I just wash my hands afterwards and, you know, break it open with a match or whatever it is. So I don't, I don't know. I've never come across any, any issues with that, but Part of the, the masks and the gloves is actually just for the whole experience for kids. They feel like little doctors and, and scientists and they're, they're putting on masks and they're strapping on gloves. I don't even know that it's necessary, but uh, it's a precaution that we take and I think of value, but um, a lot of it is actually just kids love it. And I should mention that in the United States, there have been at least one or two salmonella outbreaks traced to kids dissecting owl pellets. But it was just really? absolute worst case scenario all the way through. So I know one of them that happened in Minnesota 
it was a nature center that had, I think, a barred owl that they were feeding day old chicks. And the day old chicks apparently had salmonella. Fed it to the barred owl. Oh, oh. Yeah. And then apparently there had been some droppings on the pellets. The pellets were not sterilized. They went to a school to be dissected. They were dissected on the lunchroom tables. Um, they okay. did not all have to wash their hands with soap and water afterwards. The kitchen tables were not sterilized and they had a, so it was just the worst of every, everything went wrong the whole entire uh, process. So it's happened. It's been very rare, but it has happened. Yeah, well, I mean, all those owl pellets that we dissecting are coming. They're, they're not from captive owls at all. There's no Dale chip component to their diets. But also, you know, uh, gloves and the mask, if there is a concern, hopefully that will take care of it and the kids all wash their hands when they're finished. But I know since I was a child, I've collected owl pellets and just broke them up with my fingers and had a look at what's inside them. And I hate to admit it, probably gone off and eaten lunch directly thereafter. But I'm a lot better at washing my hands nowadays and, and all of those things. So. Someone wants to know if it's possible to contact uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology to add all those uh, native uh, names to their Birds of the World section um, for all the species. I guess they have a big list of but local bird names. That would be absolutely fantastic. I know some of those names are still being worked on because there were kids putting them together. So they need a, a little bit of a review. Sometimes they're a bit long and a bit involved. So they have to be sort of pared down, but there's lots of names and lots of languages that are absolutely ready to go. And on our website, there's a whole section there on the owl naming and you can sit and you can listen to different owls and different names, different owls and, and the spelling is correct. And all of them are, are there on the owlproject.org website. Here's a fun one. How many owl boxes do you make every year? I'm not sure, actually. I think, um, I'm not sure. We've been doing owl boxes for a long time. So I would imagine uh, probably a hundred at this stage, maybe more, maybe a little more. But we used to do more earlier on years ago we used to do more i used to come outside and say when these owl boxes are gone we're never doing any more owl boxes and that was five years ago and lots and lots of owl boxes back then you know so but in the owl boxes in, in johannesburg not counting the, the occupied owl boxes now in townships i think we've got 100 occupied owl boxes at eco solutions around Johannesburg, even more actually. So this has been our very busy time of the year, putting rings on spotted eagle owl chicks predominantly, but lots and lots of success. And one of the, the things about why, the, one of the reasons we might've had such a good year this year could have been uh, uh, related to COVID, just in terms of all the restaurants have been locked down, the parks have been closed and food available, food for rats has not been in those places. And they've started moving into residential gardens. There's a lot of residential people having rodent problems. And that's where the predominantly our boxes are in residential gardens in around Johannesburg. Where do you uh, see the project continue to develop over the next five or 10 years? There's obviously lots of work still to be done in South Africa, even though we're getting to places all over the show. You know, we, we, we kind of, we work in, almost in fits and starts. So in terms of the Eco Solutions funding of it, when we're able to, we'll go and do a month or two months in, in KZN or in Mozambique or in those kind of things. And then when we, we're not, we don't. So it, it, it kind of, but after 20 years that all of that stuff has created its sort of own momentum. But we'd like to see it moving into different parts in Africa. We've done little bits of work in other countries. But it would be really nice to establish an ourproject.org office in Zimbabwe, in Mozambique, in Zambia. And really, I mean, the, the, the issues facing owls in those areas are no different to the issues facing owls in South Africa. And the mythologies are there. And it would be nice to, to start involving our neighbors in this project. Um, somebody asked, they, well, they said they love the owl ambassadors idea and they were wondering if they could ad adopt the idea also. Yeah, absolutely. 
absolutely. The more our ambassadors, the better. Uh, someone wants to know if there are any organizations in Latin America doing similar work uh, to yours, because they, um, they see a lot of negative perceptions about owls uh, where they live and they wanna find out how they could uh, reach out to people in their community. Um, I, I don't know of any. I know that there's in, in Nepal and in India and places like that, there's a lot of people doing similar stuff to us, but I don't know about Latin America. But if they're interested, I mean, they can email us and we can help as in any way we can. You know, it's sort of, it's a simple formula. It's just really getting out there and talking to people and, and talking to kids. You know, it's, it's um, they're, they're going to they're gonna make this call going forwards about owls and how they feel about them. And so that's what we've done. Um, and, and kids have been fantastic. It, it was a lot, this was a lot easier than everyone thought it was going to be. It was, we haven't come across lots of resistance. We haven't come across lots of mythology that we've had to dealt. I mean, it's there and we deal with it, but it hasn't been a, 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 a great big wall for us. Kids are delighted in, in doing this work and being involved in this project. Probably easy, probably better, for, probably because it got them out of history and geography and mathematics or something like that. How many of South Africa's owls are threatened or endangered and are there programs to conserve them? Uh, it changes actually, but I think the grass owl, I stand to be corrected because sometimes things are put on a list or taken off a list or added to a list. And I know a whole lot of species were just added recently, like black eagle possibly, or, but, or marshal, maybe it was marshal eagle. But the, the um, grass owl was, is, is endangered or threatened. And Pell's fishing owl as well has a, a status that's threatened or near threatened. But there's lots of work. There's grass owl projects here. Um, there's Pell's fishing owl projects here to look after the, the endangered species or the, the threatened species. And a lot of that, those threats come from just habitat loss, you know, poor fire regimes for grass owls, overgrazing, that kind of thing. But in terms of barn owls and spotted eagle owls, we, we're not, the work that we do, we're not really dealing with endangered owl species. You know, it's predominantly this is an education program. It's just changing minds of, of kids so that when they're adults, they're owl friendly adults. And we get that. I mean, we get kids that have participated in this project who phone the office. So they've done a trip to Kruger National Park and they've seen an owl at the campsite and they're kind of convinced it's one of the owls they released from their release box in Sebo King, you know, and they saw the owl again. So, and, and that kind of enthusiasm is those kids are. Those kids are set now. They, they're going to be our friendly adults. And that, that'll spread to their children and, and on and on. And that's really how owls should be seen. It's just part of a valuable environmental asset in our, in our control of rats or our, our mitigation or management of rats. Uh, is your program limited to Alexander Township or is it throughout South Africa? It's throughout South Africa. Um, and we've worked all over South Africa with this program. Um, in fact, it really started in Seba, King and Soweto. So we still do quite a lot of work in those areas. But Johannesburg townships, because we've Johannesburg based and Cape Town as well. We've got a lot of, we've done a lot of work in the Cape. Um, it's, it's a national project. We've done work in odd places like Levubu with universities um, doing, and, you know, so, so there's a lot of travel involved. Do you have some recommendations for reading material regarding traditional beliefs and uses of owls? I would be very interested to learn more about what you found about owls used as muti. I think there's, um, you know, there's international stuff. There's, there's books out there on, on owls that deal with mythological fear, the owl pages and things like that on, on websites. They've got a whole lot of stuff on, on owl mythology. Uh, and I think there's a, a, a Desmond Morris book about the owl that also deals with mythological stuff and, you know, where owls fit in. And I mean, there's, there's, there's owl mythology in Shakespeare. I mean, it's all out there. 
you, I don't know if a, a book that is just owl mythology that one can can read, but um, yeah, if you look around, you'll find all sorts of things. And some of the African mythologies vary from country to country. So, you know, we have a there's a mythology in um, I don't know if it's in Nigeria, um, maybe it's Ghanaian, but in one of the African countries, I believe that if you place the eye of an owl in a, in the hand of a woman while she's asleep, when she wakes up, she's not able to tell any untruths. So there, there's some really pretty strange mythologies out there. And that's the, the essence of mythology, you know, that it's filled with strange ideas. Uh, and kind of going along with that, are there differences in the perception of owls between different cultures in South Africa? The, the, the fact that an owl landing on your roof or an owl being a messenger of doom is pretty pervasive right through all the the cultures in South Africa. That's the kind of predominant belief. Um, so, so no, not really. That's really the, the belief that everybody has. That's what it's associated with. Uh, this question came over from YouTube. Do Varro eagle owls come near the townships? Um, and some people may know or may not know that you had a cam on a Varro eagle owl nest this past year. Um, not really. Vero eagle owl don't occur around Johannesburg, essentially. So, and, and your townships are really situated around your big cities. Um, but there are, um, I don't know if they'd call them townships, but I know where that cam was. About five kilometers from there, there was a kind of an informal or a, or a township type environment, high density housing. And I'm sure that Vera Eagle Owl was, was visiting there and was capable of visiting there. And there have been, in Zimbabwe, they have been recorded as taking cats as prey items. So we never saw a cat on that nest in terms of in, in all our watching of it and, and, and examining prey on that nest. But they're perfectly capable of taking a domestic cat. And, I, and I'm sure they, in Zimbabwe they were, they were visiting those areas and, and hunting cats. All right, here's a, so a tricky... Nice. I, know, I, know, I, know one shouldn't, I know one shouldn't acknowledge this, but the, the idea of bird eats cat, was, I don't know why, I, I, it, it's, I think it's okay. As opposed to cat eat bird, you know? I mean, they get a lot of birds do cats. Occasionally the odd bird eating a cat's not... Okay, I'm gonna stop right there on the cat front. So a tricky question that we get a lot at the Owl Center, uh, overall, is the population of all owls increasing or decreasing, in this case, in South Africa? Um, it's very difficult. I don't know. I don't know. For some species, I would imagine it's increasing. And for some species, uh, I would imagine it's decreasing. I mean, those things like barn owls that are, are so rodent specific are you know, they're, they're tapping continuously trying to get into cities and all over the world because of the, the prey, the, the amount of, I mean, I know there aren't, I mean, I was in Austria, some of those kids had never seen a town rat. I couldn't believe that. Whereas in South Africa, we've got rats everywhere. So for barn owls, that's good. And you can see that in the clutch sizes of the barn owls that we're coming across, they're, 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 they're huge. Um, for some of the other owls that are dealing with habitat loss, dealing with those kinds of things, development, um, obviously their population is, is, will be declining. But I, I think, you know, that's the nature of all populations. There's a, there's a kind of ebb and flow. We shrink and we expand and we shrink depending on what pressures are being exerted upon us or freedoms we have. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think, I think um, generally our populations are probably okay apart from the ones that are endangered. Uh, do your owls molt all their feathers every year? So I assume that varies every, species. 
I, I think don't I think all birds of prey molt all their feathers every year. Nope. Don't they? No. Our great horned owls, it may take three, I think sometimes up to four years to molt all there. So the larger birds, usually it takes a long time to grow in those feathers. So they don't molt as many every year. I think smaller ones are more likely generally. Um, yeah. Most of the owls typically do a full tail molt every year, even if their flight feathers vary. Mm. Well, I think, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think generally I've seen owls that have some juvenile plumage on them and some adult plumage on them, which presumably means that they're still in their, they're in their second year of molting or maybe their third year of molting. But uh, um, a lot of the smaller birds that we deal with, like barn owls, I would presume they molt every year. This is actually not a question that anybody else asked, but I thought it might be helpful. Um, do you have any templates or plans um, for the owl boxes that you put up um, if people want to make their own? We do, we do, but the, um, you know, the owl, owl boxes are really, you know, I was looking at owl uh, infestations in, in some of the refugee camps and things in, in Africa, Morocco and, and, and places like that, even in places like Syria. And I, I thought you could actually just take an ammunition box and put a half wall across it or half face across it, stick it up on a pole, and you'd have an owl box. I mean, some of these guys are using plastic drums that they fill with a lining, and those are being and put a hole in the top. One of the problems we have in South Africa is bees. African bees love going into our owl boxes if they're not treated. So we've got to maintain and manage them every year to stop that from happening. And some of the owls, a lot of it's got to do with the actual substrate you put in the box. The box design itself isn't that important, but how you prepare the box for an owl. So for our spotted eagle owls, for example, they would, if they could choose, they would breed on the ground. So people put up boxes for them, but they expect the owl to make its own nest. So they leave a bear box up in the tree and they never have an owl in it because spotted eagles don't make their own nests. So, so they don't bring sticks and create a nest. And they're just, there's a wooden box with a wooden floor that no owl would lay an egg on because it wouldn't make sense. So they want a gravel substrate, like a pea gravel substrate where they can make a cup and they can lay their eggs in that cup so they don't roll around at the bottom of the box. So the box itself, I mean, the box designs, the internet's full of box designs and all of them pretty good. But the actual preparation of that box for the owl that you're looking to, to for example, spotted eagle owl, is actually the most important component. And with spotted eagle owl nests, you can put in a substrate. And I mean, a box is really just a cavity. You're just providing a cavity for a cavity breeding species. So you'll get all sorts of other cavity breeders going in there. You'll get, we've had bush babies or in our boxes. We've had genets in our boxes. We've had other birds using our boxes as they would any cavity. But because spotted eagle owls want to gravel substrate, when a bird comes in there and puts a whole lot of sticks and mess on top of that substrate, it's no longer an owl box. So you've got to clear all that stuff out and put it back, you know, maintain the substrate to get owls to use it. So that's the key to this thing, not really the design of the box. But if, you know, I mean, yeah, there's some beautiful owl boxes out there, but it's really just a box in a tree. Very good answer. Um, which owl species other than barn owls in South Africa are adapted to urban areas? Um, definitely spotted eagle owl. Uh, on the fringes, we get marsh owls. In most open sort of flay areas or grassland areas within cities, you can bump into marsh owl. And we also get white-faced owl that tend to, in certain years, they'll move into suburban areas and in other years they won't be there. So you're kind of at the end, you know, the city prevents them, but every now and then when there's a really good year for white-faced owls, you'll start bumping into them all over the city. And what are the grass owls? There's some grass owl nests in and around Johannesburg. Uh, I can't think of any of the others. Pearl-spotted owlets too. In places like Rustenburg, which is a city, you get pearl-spotted owls. Wood owls you find in Nelspreg. So as long as there's food and, and, and breeding you know, cavities or, or nest sites for these things, 
for owls, they'll, they'll continuously try and tap into that environment wherever they can. Um, I think that's the end of the questions, believe it or not, currently. Um, but somebody looked up the size of the spotted eagle owl. And what it's it? uh, 45 centimeters, so about 18 inches. Um, and a weight from 454 to 907 grams, which would be somewhere kind of about what our barred owls are in North America. Um, and 100 to 140 centimeter or 39 to 55 inch wingspan. Good to know. Now Thought he was a small, a short, a short spotted eagle owl. Yeah. Joe, do you want to do a spotted eagle owl imitation again for those who weren't here at the beginning? Sure. So that, I think, what I remember is the <laughs> the male is ooh 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 ooh, right? Very good, Joe. Jonathan, you want to do it also? No, thanks. <laughs> but I'm happy. No, not for me. I'm, I'm not a, uh, no. But nice to hear it. Okay, we have another question that popped in. Do you know of any children who have decided to study owls after they've grown up since you've been doing this program for 20 years? Um, we've had lots of kids say that they're going to. We've lost touch with a lot of the kids that started off in those early days, you know, but we've had lots of kids saying that they're going to be doing nature conservation when they finish school and, and that sort of thing. But we haven't had any that I know of that have come to us. It's one of the things that we wanted to do. We wanted to establish a grant at the university for kids who've gone through this program. We wanted to do some owl-related research and we wanted owlproject.org to create that annual grant at the university for kids like that. Okay, that answers the question. So I know there's been some issues with YouTube posting links. So if you're on YouTube and haven't seen the link, um, it's owlproject.org and definitely look around the website. There is a whole lot of information there and there is a section on donating um, and there's many different um, portals for donating. So if you're from the United States, I believe the PayPal portal is probably the easiest to use. That's the one that I have used personally. Um, but it's absolutely an extremely worthwhile cause to support. Um, and Jonathan, what time is it there? 1030? Uh, yeah, it's uh, 20 to 11. Okay. So thank you for doing this. We'll let you um, have the rest of your evening to yourself so you can head off to bed. Um, Thank you very much, Paula. Yes, and this program was sponsored by all the generous people who have registered for these programs that are making donations to help support this series, which is critical to making it happen. Um, there's a whole lot that goes on behind the scenes here. We have three staff in the Zoom room. One of those is popping over to Facebook. We have volunteers on YouTube. Um, and anybody who's had a webinar license um, from Zoom knows that it's very expensive. Um, so we're going to keep doing these through early March, and most of our schedule is filling in. You can find that on our website. Um, our next one will be Jim Duncan from Canada talking about long-eared owls um, watching, observing a nest using camera traps, and he will have a special guest, Rusty the long-eared owl, so we'll actually have a live owl during that presentation. So thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful holiday week or weeks or wherever you are in your um, schedule and hope to see you next week. Thanks. <laughs>